In part A, we are asked to determine the magnitude and direction of the electric field at the position of this 2 microcoulomb charge right here. And there are a couple of ways we could find the magnitude and direction of the electric field. One way would be to find the magnitude and direction of the electric force acting on the 2 microcoulomb charge and then divide that force by the amount of charge, which is two microcoulombs. That's going to be the approach that we're going to take here. So again, what we're going to do is calculate the electric force that's acting on the two microcoulomb charge and then divide that by two microcoulombs, essentially. So how do we find the overall force acting on the two microcoulomb charge? Well, we're going to have to apply Coulomb's law. So here's Coulomb's law right here. But before we can just jump in and apply that law, what we should do is draw all of the forces that are acting on the two microcoulomb charge. So for example, we can see that we have a positive seven microcoulomb charge located up here. We know that a positive charge would repel the positive two microcoulomb charge. So there would be this repulsive force pushing the two microcoulomb charge this way here. And we might label that force F27. That would just help us remember that that electrostatic force is between the 2 and 7 microcoulomb charge. Now, there's another force, of course, acting on the 2 microcoulomb charge because we have this negative charge located right next to it. Now, opposite charges, negative and positive, would attract one another. So that simply means that the negative charge is pulling the positive charge this way to the right. And we might call that force F2 comma negative four. Maybe not the greatest notation, but that just reminds us that again, that electrostatic force is acting between the two microcoulomb and the negative four microcoulomb charge. So those are the two forces. And because there are two forces, we have to use Coulomb's law twice. So that's what we're gonna do next is apply Coulomb's law twice. Why don't we start by calculating the force that we called two seven. So we can see from the equation that we have to plug in a constant whose value is 8.99 times 10 to the power of nine. It has a very strange unit of Newton meters squared divided by Coulomb squared. So that's the value for K sub E. And then we're gonna multiply that by the magnitude of the charges. Notice the charges are in absolute value signs. So even if a charge were negative, you would plug it in as a positive answer. These are both positive anyway, so we don't have to worry about that right now. So this becomes two microcoulombs and seven microcoulombs. Let's not forget that microcoulombs needs to be converted into coulombs. So to do that, you multiply by 10 to the negative six. So now your microcoulombs has been converted into coulombs. Do the same thing with the seven microcoulomb charge, convert it into coulombs like that. And then we have to divide that by the distance between them squared. This is an equilateral triangle, so all three sides are a half of a meter. That means the distance between all the charges is half of a meter. And then let's not forget to square that. So let's punch this into our calculator. And when we do that, we can see that the force acting between the two and seven microcoulomb charge is about 0.50344. And this will come out to be Newtons. Okay, very good. So that's one of the two forces. Let's go and calculate the other of the two forces. We had denoted that as F2 comma negative four. So once again, we're gonna plug into the equation along with all the charges and distances. We've plugged in the known quantities. Notice again, even though the negative charge, well, was negative, we're supposed to put in the absolute value. So we plugged it in as a positive number. So when we calculate this force, we're going to get 0 0.28768 newtons. So those are the two forces, but we still have to be careful here because those forces are acting in different directions. The one force is going to the right and the second force is sort of pointing down and to the left. So we actually have to now find the components of those forces. Now we probably all have learned that the X component of let's say the two and seven force would equal the two seven force times the cosine of an angle. And that's perfectly fine, but where you need to be careful is 
identifying the correct angle. When you measure angles in using that equation to find the sort of x component, just make sure that you're measuring the angle always from the positive x axis. So for example, the force that we had called F27 was pointing in this direction here. But the angle that we really need to figure out, if we're going to sort of use this equation here, is this angle right here. That's the angle we need. Let's go back to the picture and see if we can figure that out. Remember, you're measuring your angle with regard to the positive x-axis. Now, this angle here was 60 degrees. That means this angle right here is also 60 degrees. So if we were to measure the angle from the positive x-axis, it would be that angle right there. So that would actually be 240 degrees, right? Because you have to go 180 to get there and then add 60 more to get all the way over to the force. So that total angle is indeed 240 degrees. That's what you should use to find your x and y components of the F27 force. So for example, to find that x component, we're gonna take the force that we had calculated between the two and seven microcoulomb charge, and that was 0.50344 and that was in Newtons. And then, like I said, you're gonna multiply by the cosine of 240 degrees. That's gonna give you the X component. Do make sure that your calculator is set to degree mode when you do this, as mine was not. So I just fixed that right now, and then I'm gonna punch this in, and I can see that the X component of the 27 force is equal to negative 0.25172 Newtons. That's the X component. The Y component, of this force will equal the force times the sine of that same angle. So we're gonna take the magnitude of the force and then multiply that by the sine of 240 degrees. Let's see what this turns out to be. This turns out to be negative 0.436 approximately. So here's the X component and here's the y component. Let's go and look at the other force. Remember we had that F2 negative four force. We need the x and y components for that. That one's a little easier, isn't it? Because if you look at that force, it points exclusively along the x axis. There is no y component, in other words. So that simply means that the F, or the x component of the two negative four force was the full magnitude of the force. In other words, it was the point 28768 newtons. And then as noted, the y component of that force is zero. So those are the components x and y for the one force. Let's go and consider them in conjunction with the forces x and y components of the first force. So here they all are. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the net force. So the net force in the x direction would simply be the x components added together. So you're going to add this x component and that x component together. And when we do that, we will see that the overall x component is equal to about 0 0.036 newtons. Let's do 0 0.03596 to make sure we're completely accurate here. So there's the net x component of the electrostatic force. Now we're gonna do the y component and we're just gonna add the y components together. This one's easier, isn't it? Because we're just gonna add that to zero. So we already have the overall y component here. All right, great. So there's the total x and the total y. The next thing you need to do once you have those x and y components is to sketch a new diagram. So we know that the x component overall was positive. So we're going to have a little vector going this way. So that was 0 0.03596 newtons. And then the y component notice is negative. So it's going to be drawn downward like so and that has a magnitude of 0.436 newtons. The overall electrostatic force, finally, is this vector right here. It's basically the hypotenuse of this triangle. And because it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle, you can use Pythagorean theorem. So the net force squared is going to equal the individual components squared added together, basically the Pythagorean theorem.
we're omitting units for clarity right now. If we square and sum the right-hand side, then we have 0.191 roughly newtons. And then finally, we take the square root and we can see that the net electrostatic force acting on that charge is about 0.437 newtons. This is what we call the magnitude of that force. We're going to also want to get the direction. We can easily get the direction if we go back to our triangle. If we call this angle theta, we can see that the tangent of that angle equals the opposite side. So in this case, the opposite side would be the 0.436 divided by the adjacent side, which is this 0.03596 newtons. So you can divide 0.436 by 0.03596 and you get about 12.12, .12, but that's not the angle, that's the tangent of the angle. So to find the angle, you just do the inverse tangent of that 12.12. .12. And when you do that, you can see the angle is about 85.3 degrees. So we have a magnitude of the net force and the direction now. Specifically, it's 85.3 degrees below the positive x-axis. Notice the angle is indeed located below the positive x-axis. So let's make sure we specify that. We are finally ready to get the electric field. Recall that the electric field magnitude was the electrostatic force magnitude divided by the charge. So we've got the overall force acting on the two microcoulomb charge and then divide that by the two microcoulombs. Don't forget to convert microcoulombs into coulombs. So when you divide these quantities, you will see that the magnitude of the electric field is 218,500. And because we divided newtons by coulombs, we end up with newtons per coulomb. There's the magnitude of the electric field. And then the direction will be in the same direction as the force. Now remember, the force was sort of pointing this way, 85.3 degrees below the x-axis. The two microcoulomb charge is a positive charge. So it turns out that with positive charges, the electric field will point in the same direction as the electric force. So since the electric force was 85.3 degrees below the positive x-axis, the direction of the electric field is also going to be 85.3 degrees below the positive x-axis. That's all done. That's for part A. We go now and finish off with part B. And it says, how would the electric field at that point be affected if the charge there were doubled? Well, if we look back at the equation for electric field, we can see that if we were to double the charge, that means that this value down here would also double. But it turns out that the electrostatic force would also double. If you double the amount of charge on that two microcoulomb charge, you're going to double the amount of force. We can actually see that from Coulomb's law because if you take one of the charges and double it, that means that the force itself will also double. So in summary, doubling the charge also doubles the force and the net result is that those doublings would cancel. You would still have the same ratio of F over Q. So in short, when they ask how would the electric field be affected, the answer is that it would not be affected. So the electric field is unchanged. But then the second half of part B asks, well, what would that do to the magnitude of the electric force? And we just said that from Coulomb's law, if you double the amount of charge, you will double the amount of force. So we could say that the magnitude of the electric force is doubled. And those are the correct answers to part B. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I'd greatly appreciate it. But if not, I still appreciate you taking the time to watch the video.